Good afternoon and welcome to week two of the 2024 January series at Calvin University. My name is Michael Wiltskid and I'm the director of the series. Would you please take a moment to silence your cell phones? As you are doing so, I would like to welcome guests at all of our remote viewing locations, including Hastings, Michigan, Anna Maria Island, Florida, Linden, Washington, and those joining us on the CRC and TV in Nigeria. To all those attendees all around the world and you in person here, we are grateful you are joining us today. And now, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Jesus, bread of life, you came down from heaven, sent by the Father to give fullness and life to the world. You have invited us to your table, promising to never drive us away. We confess that unlike you, we at times place boundaries around our tables. Forgive us. Today, as we listen and reflect on living in community, we pray that your spirit would be at work in us to challenge and encourage us to engage community and our tables in ways that glorify you and bring your abundance and life to the world. Jesus, in your sustaining name we pray, amen. And now I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Kendall Vanderslice. Kendall Vanderslice is a baker, a writer, and the founder of the Edible Theology Project, an educational nonprofit connecting the communion table to the kitchen table. She earned her Master's of Theology Studies from Duke Divinity School and a Master's in Gastronomy from Boston University. She has committed her life to the study of food and is a professionally trained baker. Through her work in food studies and theology, Vanderslice explores the way God uses the table to restore communities and creation. In her most recent book, By Bread Alone, A Baker's Reflection on Hunger, Longing, and the Goodness of God, she discusses her faith journey, shares recipes, and dives into the role of bread in church history. In 2018, Vanderslice was named a James Beard Foundation National Scholar for her work bridging food and religion. She, she is the author of We Will Feast, Rethinking Dinner, Worship, and the Community of God, and her writing appears in Christianity Today, Christian Century, Faith and Leadership, and Religion News Service. Kendall will be available to greet the audience in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following her presentation. Calvin University is grateful to an anonymous supporter of the January series for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Kendall Vanderslice. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here with all of you today. When I was five years old, I stole my first communion. My church, Richardson Heights Baptist Church in Richardson, Texas, was holding a special service to celebrate the congregation's 40th anniversary. We were meeting in a high school auditorium in order to create space for all of the extra people that would be coming back to town to visit this special celebratory service. But the auditorium still ran out of seats, and so my siblings and I were seated in the aisles next to a big box of communion to-go cups. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Those little plastic cups with grape juice that are sealed off with a cracker attached at the top. Now, at my childhood church, children were allowed to take communion when they understood what it meant. We were told that it was a reminder of Jesus' death and resurrection. At five years old, I had not yet asked Jesus into my heart. I had not yet been baptized, and so I was not supposed to take communion. But something about the box that day just beckoned me. It was like the bread inside was just begging me to consume. And so when the lights were low and my parents were paying attention to the preacher on the stage, I slipped my hand inside the box and I stole a portion for myself. I peeled back the plastic wrapping 
and I placed the cracker on my tongue. I was afraid that chewing might be too loud and might alert my parents to my theft, and so I let it soften on its own. I let Jesus disintegrate on my tongue. And then I looked down at that cup of juice, and I was flooded with shame. I was horrified by the hunger that had driven me to consume this forbidden food, this temptation that I could not overcome. And so I stuffed the cup of juice inside my pocket, which I then brought to my parents in tearful confession later that afternoon. Ever since that day, bread has continued to call out to me. It has continued to shape my entire life, my studies, my writing, and my career. I cannot say for sure that I understand what communion means. Sure, it is a means of remembering Jesus' death and resurrection, but it is so much more than that, too. And probing that mystery has become my life's work. Food is a powerful storytelling device. The foods that we eat and the foods that we avoid, the foods that connect us to family or to home, it says something about who we are and where we come from. Food tells stories of displacement and migration, of moments of plenty and moments of want, of social hierarchies and family relationships. Food tells stories about the creativity and the resilience of our ancestors in the face of famine and oppression, or upon encountering new flavors, new ingredients, or new cooking techniques. The stories that food tells are as beautiful and as complicated as the families and the faith communities that we come from. Behind every bite of food is a story of gender, of class, of race, and of place. The Tejana poet Carolina Hinojosa Cisneros calls meals generational storytelling with an open mouth and a heaping spoon. Some meals are explicitly designed to tell the story of a particular people. The Passover Seder, for instance, is a meal where every item on the table is used to tell a story about God's deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. When a community shares the Seder meal together, they tell a particular story about a particular set of events through the foods that they eat, while also participating in a larger global story about the Jewish people throughout history who have constantly turned to God again and again for deliverance in the face of oppression. A couple of months ago, many of us here probably celebrated Thanksgiving with our families. This is another example of a meal that tells a story about what Americans have wanted this country to be, It's a complicated tale told through turkey and squash and cranberry sauce, but at its best, this meal is an opportunity to wrestle with our nation's past while inviting us to strive to become the kind of community that we long to be. Our senses have a powerful ability to hold on to memories. Oftentimes, we treat sight and sound as the most reliable of our senses, treating taste and touch and smell as less important, as more basic. But these basic senses, these senses of taste and of smell, are actually better than sight or sound at helping us to locate memories. The location in the brain that processes smell sends information immediately to the limbic system, which processes memory and emotion. It's why a smell can so easily transport you back to a place or an event. This close connection between memory and taste and smell is also why the table can be such a powerful place for building community, for communal storytelling, 
and for remembering. It is a powerful and meaningful place for building relationships. I believe that God chose meals as a storytelling device because the table is a place where we can hold together the beautiful and the painful parts of ourselves, remembering where we came from, while at the same time forming ourselves into the kinds of community that we long to become. I want to share with you today just a glimpse of the story that God tells through food. It's a story that most of us here know well and love deeply. A story of creation, fall, and redemption. It's a story so central to our faith that it can almost seem impossible to read it with fresh eyes. But as we look at this story today, we're going to see that it is a story told through meals. And I believe that it is a story that we need to remember and to honor by sharing food together in community, too. I hope that by the end of my talk here this afternoon, you will be convinced that perhaps the greatest need in most of our communities right now is to simply sit at the table and converse a little bit more than we currently do. Scripture opens with an image of God as divine creator. After separating light and dark, the seas and the skies, the water and the dry land, God fills the earth and the skies and the seas with all kinds of living things, birds and bugs and fish and more. After every act of creation, the book of Genesis repeats the same refrain, And God saw that it was good. Then the triune God, the God that exists in perpetual community, said, let's create one more thing, a creature in our image. And so God picks up a handful of this lush soil and breathes into it the breath of life. And behold, Adam, a human being, God tells the human to care for this new creation, to tend to this delightful world. But here, the book of Genesis breaks its pattern. There was something not good about this final act of creation. This human being was alone. And so God crafted a companion for him, another human to share in both the tending to and the delighting in God's beloved creation. Then God looked on this whole of creation and God called it very good. From the beginning of scripture, we see that God created humanity with two basic needs. The need to draw nutrition and energy from food and the need to share our lives with other humans. We could have been made with skin that could convert energy from the sun, or with feet that could draw up nutrients out of the soil. But instead of chlorophyll or root systems, we got taste buds and we got tables. Our joint needs for food and for community are met at the same time and in a delicious and pleasurable way when we gather together around the table. Every time we eat, we face the humbling reminder that we cannot exist as autonomous, independent creatures. We are all fully reliant on the work of farmers and cooks and earthworms and bees and microbes in order to exist at all. Eating and sharing food with others has, from the very beginning of creation, been a way of delighting in the gifts of God and also living into the fullness of what it means to be human. But our relationship to food is complicated, to say the least. For many people, eating is not an act of goodness or of joy. Maybe you have allergies, and every meal is a reminder of the danger that certain foods might bring. Eating might feel 
inconvenient. Or even worse, eating with others might make you feel like you are an inconvenience. Maybe you know the grip of hunger, the worry over whether or not you will have a meal tomorrow or the next day or the next. Maybe the very foods that connect you to your family and connect your family to home were the butt of jokes in elementary school. Maybe you can't look at food without counting up calories and wondering how many miles you would have to run to burn all of it off. Or maybe you stand in a grocery store aisle and you feel utterly conflicted because you want to pay attention to the care for God's creation and you want to purchase foods that support fair treatment of farm workers, but your budget is tight and your teenage son eats 4,000 calories a day and your daughter is begging you for Cheetos and your toddler has just stopped eating vegetables and you cannot appease them all. As much as the table unites us to one another and unites us to our creator, the table is also a reminder that the world is not as it's meant to be. Two trees stood together in the middle of the garden where these first humans lived, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God had only given these early humans one thing to do, to care for and delight in God's creation. But God had given them one restriction as well, and it was a restriction on what they could eat. Feast on the fruits of all of these trees, God told them. Just stay away from one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But as you probably know, that temptation, it proved too great. And so they plucked from this forbidden tree and they ate. They took the very vegetation that was intended to sustain and to be sustained by them. And they used it selfishly. The Orthodox priest Alexander Schmemann says that the fruit of that tree was food whose eating was condemned to be communion with itself alone and not with God. It is the image of the world loved as an end in itself. And eating it is the image of life understood. I'm sorry. It is the image of the world loved for itself. And eating it is the image of life understood as an end in itself. Schmemann says that the original sin that took place that day was a ceasing to hunger after God and God alone. It was a ceasing to see every aspect of life as utterly dependent on an interdependent world as a sacrament of communion with God. Immediately their eyes were opened. With juice still dripping down their fingers, they looked down at their naked bodies. Rather than behold the beauty of her curves or the powerful ability for her belly to bring forth new life, the woman saw the dimples of her thighs and the softness of her middle. The man felt sweat break out upon his brow as the soil sprouted forth thistles and thorns. They felt shame at the nakedness they had always known as beauty, and they looked to the vegetation around them to cover up. In that bite, these first humans realized that everything that God had created and called good could be used for evil as well. In just one quick meal, all of these relationships that God designed as good, relationships with our bodies, relationships with the ground, relationships with our neighbors and our families, relationships with creation, and ultimately our relationship with God, became relationships marred by the brokenness of this world. The joy of new life, whether out of the ground or out of the woman's body, required sweat and tears and pain. Food and eating mark the brokenness of the creation that God so desperately loves. Every time we shop, every time we cook, every time we eat, we live into this complex tale. A story about food and bodies that God called good, and a story about a world that is not as it's meant to be. But this meal of forbidden food is not the only life-changing 
world-altering meal in Scripture. The story continues in the life and the ministry of Jesus. All throughout the Gospels, we read stories of Jesus eating and Jesus feeding. From the feeding of the 5,000, making himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread on the path to Emmaus, extending forgiveness to Peter in an offering of fish. It is through food that Jesus demonstrates for us God's commitment to healing and to restoration. On the night before his death, Jesus offered his disciples a meal. This bread, he tells his disciples, it is my body. This cup, it is my blood. Eat, drink, remember me. One small meal of forbidden food brought death into this world. But through his death, Jesus reclaimed our eating as a sign of new life to come. As you eat together, he told his followers, tell the story of this bread and this cup. Tell the story of my body and my blood, this death that brings the world back to life. When we share with one another the bread and the cup, we remember that God breathed into the belly of Mary and brought forth a new Adam in Jesus, the word who was present in the beginning, the bread that promises we will hunger no more, the rabbi who ate with those marginalized by society, who turned water into fine wine and five loaves and two fish into a meal for a crowd of thousands. The communion meal is the storytelling meal of all storytelling meals. It is a meal where more is happening than we can possibly fathom. It is a meal that is meant to nourish, but as the Episcopal priest, Father Robert Farrar Capon says, the wine elevates the meal from mere nourishment to conviviality. This meal marks the pleasure that we are meant to find in the act of eating, while narrating for us again and again the story of Christ's death and resurrection. This meal marks Christ's promise to heal community while also doing the very act of community formation. And this meal purposely leaves us a little bit unsatisfied, teaching us to hunger all the more the new creation yet to come. Every time we smell wine or feel the chew of bread between our teeth, whether it's at the communion table or at the dinner table, we are brought back to the Last Supper in the upper room. We carry on the memory that is passed down from generation to generation while also living out its very fulfillment. The communion meal itself also holds together this tension of simultaneous brokenness and goodness in our world. This meal has been the source of so much church division, even as it is the meal that forms us together as one body. But despite that reality, here is what brings me hope today, and what I hope also brings hope to all of you. God is at work in a particular and a mysterious way at the communion table, despite all of its complexities. But that communion meal is emblematic of what God does at all of our daily tables as well. And for that reason, it is vital that our churches, our communities, and our homes serve as places where we share meals with friends, family, neighbors, and strangers. At our daily tables, we are able to see and know our neighbors, to share stories about each other's points of joy and points of fear. We're able to address one another's needs, and we're able to delight in this pained but pleasurable world that God has made. It is through these mundane meals that God heals us and shapes us into more trusting, more loving, and more caring communities. From both the records of the church historian Tertullian, as well as from the second chapter of Acts, we know that the early church ate together as a primary part of their worship. 
They practiced communion with their entire bodies as they feasted together in remembrance of Jesus and as they waited in anticipation of Christ's return. Their churches brought together men and women from all socioeconomic levels to feast together in one another's homes, subverting the social order and addressing the very real needs for food and for community that existed among them. We see this practice of eating together as worship in Paul's letters to the church at Corinth as well. Although in Paul's letter, we get a little bit of a reality check. It turns out these meals did not always function as they were intended. Part of the work of the church was harnessing this God-given ability of eating together to transform relationships. But even these meals that were meant for healing all too easily perpetuated the divisions of society instead. It is this context that can help us understand a little bit more of Paul's concern around communion in his letters to the Corinthian church. When you eat and drink in an unworthy manner, he says in 1 Corinthians 11, it is not the Lord's Supper that you share. You eat and drink judgment upon yourselves. The meals that Paul describes in this chapter fail to take seriously the incredible importance of eating together. They fail to recognize the ways that this meal has the power to build community. Instead, they allow the rich to feast and get drunk, while the poor go hungry in the outer rooms. These meals maintained the divisions of broader society, and in turn, they were a mockery of the very meal that was instituted by Christ. They were a mockery of the very call of the church. Paul's warning to the church in Corinth is a warning against the ignoring of the power of the table to reveal both the brokenness and the goodness of creation. It urges us to take seriously the holy purpose of hospitality in our lives and in our churches. The practice of eating together in community continued to be a central rhythm of church life throughout much of church history. It's how churches have passed down stories from generation to generation about where they have come from and about who they want to be. The rhythms of communal fasting and feasting during the church year have shaped not just church communities, but entire cuisines as well. If you take a look at any Greek Orthodox church cookbook, you are almost sure to find entire sections devoted to foods that are appropriate during a fast. Last year, a friend shared with me her experience in Ethiopia during the season of Lent. She talked about entire restaurants adjusting their menus to accommodate the Ethiopian Orthodox fasting restrictions. Here in the United States, the church potluck, the Wednesday night fellowship meal, and dinners on the ground have long been a core part of churches' identities. In the year 2000, the Protestant historian Daniel Sachs wrote that Protestants eat before church and after church, and occasionally during church. If you ask American Protestants why they go to church, they're likely to say that they go not for the doctrine or the ethics, but for the community a community usually built and sustained around food. But over the last few decades, something has begun to shift. Our lives have become so busy that communal meals for most people are treated as a luxury, as something to fit into the remaining spaces of our lives if we find the time. Community is viewed as an optional addition to church life, rather than the natural and the necessary outpouring of our worship. The reality is that sometimes community is awkward, and it's uncomfortable, and it's inconvenient. Conversations over coffee hour can be dull at best, and they can be painful at worst. Church aunties probe into your dating life, or they ask you when you're going to have kids, 
There's usually at least one person who has no filter, and you feel embarrassed on his behalf whenever he opens his mouth. Staying for a fellowship meal cuts into your Sunday when you could be grocery shopping or meal prepping or otherwise getting yourself and your family set for the week ahead. Wednesday night suppers just don't fit between soccer practice and violin lessons and homework. I totally get that these rhythms that used to be so central to the church, I get why they have fallen by the wayside, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic so disrupted our communities and our practices of gathering. In a culture that wants us to optimize our time, our body, and our money, slowing down and building community around the table feels kind of like a waste. But when we look at the ramifications of losing these rhythms of communal eating, it turns out the awkwardness and the wasted time is a really small price to pay. Over the last decade, the U.S. Surgeon General has sounded the alarm on the dangers of the loneliness epidemic. When we are lonely, our bodies and our brains go into self-protective mode. Our bodies are designed to fear that no one will come to our aid in an emergency, and so they reserve their resources as much as possible. As a result, loneliness takes a physical toll on the human body, equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's associated with a greater risk of heart disease, depression, anxiety, and dementia, as well as impairing creativity and executive function. Loneliness in our day and age has been deemed a public health crisis. In addition to the physical toll that loneliness takes on our bodies, there is a massive social toll as well. When our brains go into that self-protective mode, the people and the ideas that we do encounter, they begin to look kind of like a threat. This heightens our sense of danger, and it feeds the social and the cultural polarization that is tearing our communities apart. Counterintuitively, research shows that when people are lonely, they are actually less likely to reach out to in-person friends and community, to reach out to the very people that have the capacity to address this core need. Instead, we're more likely to turn to the internet, <laughs> to turn to our online communities where these simplistic and flattened narratives of others feel safer than the robust and complicated people that we meet in real life, where we can fulfill that immediate need for connection without the friction that is inherent to in-person relationships. It turns out that friction the awkwardness and discomfort that we sometimes feel at the church coffee hour plays a really important role in helping us understand one another. It builds relationships that makes plain the robust and the nuanced nature of the people in our lives. It conditions us to resist the flattened narratives that we encounter online and that are perpetuated in digital spaces. In order to address the loneliness and the social and cultural polarization that are plaguing our communities, we must take the time to slow down and sit with friends, and maybe even with the people that we struggle to call friends. We must sit down, and together we need to eat. Last year, I polled my social media communities to find out about how many times, on average, they eat with someone outside of their family each week. Now, obviously, a social media poll is not the most academically rigorous way of acquiring data, and I can't say for sure how these results translate to the larger American public, but if anything, I would guess that my social media audience tends to be more invested in communal eating than your average American. Out of hundreds of responses, 75% told me that they eat with someone outside of their family zero to one time per week. The biggest barrier across the board was being too busy, and a close second was a lack of people to eat with. <laughs> 
I was gutted by the number of people who told me in direct messages, I would love to eat with friends more often, but every time I ask, they're too busy to commit. What would it look like for us to resist the tides of busyness that lead us to this loneliness and that further polarization? At the Edible Theology Project, the organization that I founded and that I run, we believe the solution begins at the two tables that are central to Christian tradition, the communion table and the fellowship table. We provide a curriculum that's called Worship at the Table. This program serves two main purposes. First, it guides participants through a study of meals in scripture and in Christian tradition. And second, it helps the communities identify the ways that they are best equipped to build rhythms of eating together into their communal lives. It encourages them to look at the gifts and the limitations of their particular community so that they can build something sustainable, something that works for the very hungers that exist among them. If you are here and longing for deeper community in your life, if you are hungry for people to eat and converse with, as awkward and sometimes inconvenient as that might be, then I hope maybe you'll consider introducing this program to your church. But you don't need a fancy curriculum or a fellowship hall or a formal dining room table to begin telling stories with friends around the table. You can begin by just inviting friends over for something as simple as spaghetti or for cups of ramen around your coffee table. You, what is most important is recognizing this shared need for food and this shared need for one another, a need that God so delightfully meets around the table. I believe that God offered us a meal of bread and wine as the cornerstone of our worship because it is the sharing of food that mends our relationships to one another. This bread and this cup tell a story. They tell a story of brokenness and redemption, a story of death and resurrection, and the actual sharing of full meals together in community forms relationships that allow us to experience a taste of God's healing here and now. Food is a gift from God meant to draw us deeper into relationship with one another and with God. And food is also an ongoing reminder of the brokenness of community and of creation. Yet somehow, we can still gather around the table and tell stories about food. And in the process, we get a taste of God's goodness and a taste of God's redemption here today. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Gulker. I'll be moderating with Kendall this afternoon. Um, I am uh, the president and co-founder of an organization called the Colossian Forum. Uh, we do conflict transformation, not that there's any of that in the air these days. Um, I'm also a Calvin alum and most importantly for today, uh, a friend of Kendall. So it's really good to see you. Okay, Appreciate you. your work. Um, one, one of the things that strikes me about your work is it's, it's like when you get a new car or a car that's new to you, and all of a sudden you look around and everybody has that car. <laughs> yeah. um, once you start looking at scripture through the lens that you provide us and remind us of, of food, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of um, mind-boggling to, to uh, discover that you've been floating along without thinking about it. So besides the rather Augustinian pear-stealing incident early in your life, uh, <laughs> stealing communion, um, what, what allowed you to see this mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then to work on it and to offer it to us as, as a gift the way you have? Yeah. I have always loved food. 
clearly since the age of five when this box of bread just beckoned me. Um, and so I knew kind of from an early age that I was interested in working in food in some capacity. Um, and so when I began work in the restaurant industry, um, I, I, I was doing my work in the restaurant industry and I was working on a degree in food studies at Boston University. And my research at, at Boston University was on kind of the social dynamics of the table. Um, what happens when we eat together that changes the way that relationships are formed. Um, and I would, my program was kind of all my classes were in the evenings, um, and so I would spend kind of my weekday mornings working in a bakery and my weekday evenings in class. Um, and then on Sundays, I would work in the bakery on Sunday morning, and then I would go to church in the afternoon. Um, and I would receive communion every week with bread dough still stuck to my arms. <laughs> and then I would go to class where I was researching the table. And I began to question, what does this bread that I spend my morning making have to do with this bread that I'm offered at the communion table? And then what is my research on the table more generally? How might that shape my understanding of why a table is this central image in Christian practice? Um, so I think it was actually the, the ongoing rhythm of eating together uh, of eating in the communion meal and the fellowship meal, and then also baking bread all day that sort of forced me to question, what does this have to do with kind of this meal that is central mm. to my worship? I have a lot of questions, um, but it's also, we want to open the Q&A to the crowd, the audience both here and remote, and welcome to you all. Um, thank you for coming out on the cold day. Um, if anybody has a question, please feel free to email at any time to askjseries at calvin.edu. That's askjseries at calvin.edu. We did some work together last May, um, bringing together a number of pastors who were working on conflict. And uh, even right before we walked out here, you mentioned it seems strange to be talking about bread when we're in the middle of all of this turmoil. Can you draw connections between um, the communion table and our present moment and why you think this might be just exactly the right thing to be doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my sort of research project unwittingly sort of began in around the fall of 2016. Um, so I, I wrote my thesis for my, um, my food studies program in sort of fall of 2015, spring of 2016. And in that time, I wrote on one specific church that ate together as a primary part of their worship. Um, and in that time, I learned of dozens of other churches across the country who were doing something similar. Um, and so that's when I realized kind of maybe there's a bigger research project here. Um, and so I had been invited to write a book on the topic and had kind of the fall of 2016 and spring of 2017 to visit churches that were eating together and to study what was happening in these communities. Um, so in case you don't remember, that was somewhat of a fraught time in many of our churches. Um, and so I ended up sort of studying churches from a, a wide variety of denominations um, in a wide variety of geographic locations, urban, suburban, and rural spaces, um, and looking at how is this rhythm of eating together changing the ways that they interact. Um, and so it was in, in some ways a really beautiful picture of kind of there was this national narrative of the ways that our churches were really um, facing all this internal strife. And also I was witnessing these churches where really hard conversations were taking place in really fruitful ways. Um, it was awkward sometimes. I sat in on some very uncomfortable conversations, but there were actual conversations taking place, not fights in Facebook comments. Um, and so I began to question how does the table itself facilitate this dialogue, mm -hmm. but also how does the connection of the fellowship table to the communion table have something to do with that. Um, and it is, in my mind, no small thing that God gave us a meal as this central piece of Christian worship, and that it is a meal that is meant to draw us together as one body. We are made one in the body and the blood of Christ. Um, and it is kind of this meal that has been the source of so much division, and yet somehow at the same time, it is the meal that reminds us that amongst our differences that God is drawing us together, and that in fact our differences reveal something good about the ways that we image God. 
Um, and so I think in this day today, we first need these rhythms of eating together in order to have the conversations that we need to have. Um, but we also need this reminder that we are one in the body of Christ with the people that we seriously disagree with. We will sh sit at the, at the, um, the supper of the lamb mm -hmm. one day with the people that we would like to condemn to hell on Twitter right now. Uh, that one day we will feast together at God's table and we have to learn how to, um, how to care for and love those who are the same body of Christ as us even if we strongly disagree with them. Um, and so I think this practice of actually baking bread and sharing bread can be a really helpful tool into that in, as a way that um, it gives us a practice with our, uh, with our bodies uh, to help kind of slow us down, to help uh, ground us, to have kind of this meditative prayer practice as we bake, um, but also to serve as a reminder that this bread connects me to millions of Christians around the world and throughout history who maybe believe slightly differently than I do or who have experienced the power of God in a different way than I have. And I have something to learn from them and I am in community with them, even if it makes me very uncomfortable to recognize. Yeah. I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about the connection between the fellowship table and the communion table. I've got a number of questions here around some of your comments about um, food being about convenience, um, the drugs that are out on the, uh, the market that tamp down appetite, and there are all of these ways in which the way we think about food in our bodies can be malformed. Yeah. Um, so that's a part of the question. And then you said that you had visited with some churches that were making the meal integral to their worship. So I've got a question from T. DeBoer. How can a genuine meal practically be a part of worship. So what's the relationship between the, the communion table and the fellowship table? And then maybe how do these, these two in combination form us into healthier ways of, of, of thinking about our bodies and food? So I think that the fellowship table should be a natural outpouring of the communion table. Um, that the, that what we sort of commit to one another and to God when we participate in communion should then be acted out at a fellowship table altogether. Um, that it is kind of a continuation of the work that God is doing at the communion table. Um, I think that there are some traditions that have a really robust theology of what is of the communion table, who, who take it very seriously, who think very deeply what's happening here, and form their congregation deeply in sort of this, this love of the communion table, um, that also have very anemic communal practices, um, yeah. anemic practices of actually eating together as community. On the flip side, I know there are traditions that have very sort of anemic views, I think, of what's happening at the communion table, and yet have incredibly rich traditions of their church potlucks and their fellowship tables. Um, and I think that we actually experience God's community-forming power in both ways. I think there are ways in which these differences can illuminate something good about one another. Um, and my hope is that people can see the depth and the richness of what's happening in both places and actually view the fellowship table as this natural outpouring of the communion table. Um, but I also think that we can experience, uh, we can sort of pay attention to how God is working in our church no matter whether or not they sort of do one or the other very well. Um, but another reason that I think it is really important for us to, uh, to really pay attention and take seriously this fellowship table is um, the, the ways that it opens up possibility for ecumenical dialogue among, those, among Christians who cannot actually share at the same communion table. Um, so I... I helped facilitate an event this last fall um, that had a combination of Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox together. And it was all about the table and all about the sacramentality of the table. And there was this irony that we could not actually share communion together. Um, and yet, because we couldn't share communion together, it gave us this opportunity to, to recognize what is God doing at the tables that we do share together. And how can our recognition of what's God, what God is doing at the tables we do share together create a space for us to talk about our points of disagreement over what is happening at the communion table? Um, and it led to a really 
beautiful, fruitful dialogue. Um, it is leading to some sort of worship materials that will be released um, later this year, and I think shows us kind of a, a hopeful vision of how God can use the table to, um, to facilitate deeper community, even in the areas where it feels perhaps broken beyond yeah. repair. Yeah. Let's chase that a little bit. I've got a great question from a remote site. Do you have any thoughts on the open communion table where anyone baptized, confirmed or not, may receive the elements? <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> this is, this is a, a topic that... Um, well, I would imagine it came up in that conversation. It's come up, it's come up many <laughs> times. <laughs> and I think this is where I sort of... I, I um, am inherently unsatisfying in my answer because I kind of try and circumvent the answer. I think in some ways it's the wrong question. Um, I think that we... Uh, like, there's just no way we're going to get a group of Christians together and we're going to come to a consensus on this question of, is the table open to anyone or is the table reserved for baptized believers? Um, is the table for those who are members of a particular church or is it open to anyone who is a Christian? Like, we're not going to come to a consensus on that. And that's okay. Um, I, I believe that, you know, if you have, if you have deep convictions on what the communion table is for, then it is good that you hold to those convictions. I have personal convictions in this regard, and I purposefully don't share them because I want to be able to work in this sort of cross, um, this work across traditions. Um, but we can, um, we can hold to differing beliefs about what is happening at the communion table and who it is for, and we can learn something from those who hold a different belief um, and also, we can understand that although we might disagree about the logistics of this table, it still points to something larger about how God is at work in church communities and beyond our church communities as well. I want to stay on this just a bit. I, um, I'm a Calvin grad. I grew up here mm -hmm. and love this place immensely. It's been hugely positive um, formational power in my life. But the tendency is to, uh, at least in the way that I received my, my formation, is to be a little bit of a brain on a stick. <laughs> and so thinking about food is, is new to me. Um, thinking about it theologically and thinking about how shot through it is. Um, so this, this question seems really important. And I, I'm wondering if... Um, thinking about the fellowship table and the communion table might allow us to get a little bit further. And what I mean by that is in the, in the work of conflict transformation that we do all the time, what's critical is slowing people down because in conflict you're in your amygdala and you gotta get to your prefrontal cortex. The meal is the perfect place to slow down. Um, I'm wondering if, if the fellowship table were thick enough, that would give us the space we need to work out the communion table. I'd just like you to reflect on that. Um, I don't, do you mean to work it out as in like come to a consensus? Uh, I'll let you decide how you want to <laughs> chase well, that. Well, I think I actually, um, so Thomas Aquinas in, so the sort of, if we'll go, if we'll go back to sort of an earlier communion debate that divided the church, sort of the, the, like an early sort of debate in the, um, the great schism. So the, the schism between the Eastern and the Western church was this question of yeast and whether or not the bread served at the communion table should contain leaven. Um, and the Eastern church said, yes, it needs to be leavened. The Western church said, no, it needs to be unleavened. And of course, you know, the theological debate was much bigger than just a question of yeast, but this is where it started. Mm -hmm. um, and so Thomas Aquinas in sort of in his summa and writing on this question, um, he is asked, should the bread of communion contain yeast or not contain yeast? And his response is, if you are in the East, then you should follow <laughs> the, the tradition of your church and you should have bread that is leavened. And if you are in the West, you should follow the tradition of your church and you should have bread that is unleavened. Um, and I actually am grateful for that response on his part because I think what he is saying is there is a very rich theological understanding of why you would serve leavened bread at communion. And there is an equally rich and historical tradition behind why you would serve unleavened bread at communion. And actually in the tension between those two, we see something even bigger about bread. Um, and it's not to say that the fight doesn't matter. It's not to say that the theological debate doesn't matter. It actually matters very deeply, but coming to a different 
space, like we see something important in that those um, sort of the wrestling between, between those differences as well. Um, and so I think in the same way, you know, when I, when I first started my research on this church in Massachusetts, um, I was attending this church on Thursday evenings to do my research, and then I attended, um, it was a, a Methodist church, it was a very sort of low church practice in the ways that they gathered, and then on Sundays I would attend my Anglican church, which is, you know, a very high church sort of liturgical tradition, um, and I think it was in the differences between the two that I, allow, I was able to appreciate each of them mm-hmm. more fully. And so I think the fellowship table is a place where we can hear the differences among us and then appreciate more fully what it is that we see in our differences of Eucharistic theology. Um, but I don't actually think that the church needs to come to a consensus mm-hmm. on, on that regard. Yeah. Uh, in the workshop that you did with us last May, um, in a slightly sunnier, warmer climb. <laughs> um, you spent a lot of time talking about the process of, of bread making where the tensions were critical to the process. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, again, in our work, one of the questions that we, we get most often is, can you just help me manage a Thanksgiving meal? <laughs> right? Uh, how do I get through this meal? Yeah. And so you're recommending that we eat together. <laughs> and we're not very good. So... Do you, do you um, thinking about inviting and sharing meals, do you have any special conversation questions that can help us connect? <laughs> so my favorite sort of initial conversation prompt, whenever I facilitate meals, um, especially meals among people, like the meal that we shared, where mm-hmm. we knew it would be people from a wide range of traditions, is I always start with tell a story about a meal that's very meaningful to you and tell a story about the most uncomfortable or awkward meal you've ever been a part of. Um, and what happens is we get a wide variety of stories, deeply meaningful stories. We oftentimes get a story of someone's wedding or perhaps a funeral. We get stories of kind of, um, of first dates where people, you know, someone's first date with their spouse. And then we also get stories um, that are either like massive social faux pas or they have to do with sort of cultural clashes. Um, And so what happens is in these stories of things that are meaningful and things that are awkward, we start to hear stories about the places that people come from, the families that they're a part of, um, their cultural traditions. um, But we also hear kind of these stories of class, of race, of place, the way it all intersects. And so um, it is something that is very sort of, at the surface, it's very fun. It is fun to talk about meals. It is very safe to talk about a meal that's meaningful to you. And it becomes a way into conversations about so many other things. Um, And so I do think that kind of a simple, perhaps silly question, like tell me stories of meaningful meals can be really valuable. Not the Thanksgiving table that's maybe different because you know a lot of stories of the people who are at your table. Um, but one thing that I, I like to remind people about something like the Thanksgiving table, um, it has this sort of connection with being fraught um, because, because we love the people that we are gathered with deeply. And it is out of the love for the people that we are gathered with that we then fight. <laughs> there's, a sense of, there's a sense that, like, I, that these people can... Um, can, I can trust them to be able to hold this sort of the fullness of my emotions or my fears or my concerns, but also it's out of my love for them that I care about the fact that we disagree on something that's important. Um, And so kind of keeping that in mind that it is underneath sort of the layers of what we're fighting about probably is kind of this sense of love that is driving the division. And then reminding yourself, I care deeply because I love this person, and they also care deeply because they love me, then how can that change sort of get us to rewind out of sort of our heads and into sort of this deeper understanding of, wait, at the core, there's a care for one another that's driving us into this fight. And in some ways, the table becomes a place where we can safely manage that fight, And also, we need to recognize when it's good to step away. And we can have some very silly conversation starters that re-remind us of our love for one another and our ability to laugh together and kind of get us to set aside for a little bit the fraught tension that comes to the fore at this table. Kendall, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, The reminder that the tensions are actually rooted in shared loves, Mm -hmm. I think, is so, so important. And you said earlier about you think it's the wrong question, do this, do that. So maybe you're suggesting a right question, which is how do we love God and neighbor a bit more through this process that takes time. Mm 
And yeah. it's something we all have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last, we've got time for one last question, I think. Um, so you, you, you talked a little bit about this, this ebb and flow between fun and silly and, and deep and, and, and harder uh, conversations. Um, what do you do when, when significant racial, racial and cultural barriers sort of emerge in the middle of a conversation mm -hmm. at the fellowship table? Just ending on a nice, light, easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, again, one of the things that I think is truly the gift of facilitating these conversations in Christian community and connecting the communion table to the fellowship table is this reminder that at the end of the day, we all commit to um, our, love, our participation in God's church through the sharing of the communion table. So at the fellowship table, there are going to be these intense disagreements that arise, um, disagreements that we cannot resolve in a single meal together. Um, disagreements that will require storytelling over time, that will require commitments to relationship over time to be able to fully sort of get into the story behind the story behind the story. But at the end of the day, we have to remember that we are committed in sharing communion together or in sharing communion at all. We are committed to Christ's global and historical church and so we are committed to the people that we have gathered together with. And that needs to be the foundation of our then commitment to hearing the stories behind the stories behind the stories. Um, and so we are not going to resolve at any table. You know, you're probably not going to resolve the full scope of kind of what arises in that context. Um, but I, I do think that there is a unique gift to having these conversations in Christian community where we have that communion meal as kind of the core of our relationship with one another. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you. If you're interested in more and you want to get back to these practical questions, edible, edibletheology.com? Yep. Edibletheology.com. Um, thank you, Kendall. This has been beautiful. Uh, I really appreciate um, the richness and practicality of your work. And thanks to our daily underwriter, to all of you that came in person, to our virtual audience online, over 2,000 people. We're grateful you all joined us today. Please join us again tomorrow to visit with Lydia Dugdale. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>